welcome guys into the in this uh, last uh, lecture of week 8 of soil science and technology and we'll be trying to finish this uh, um, soil organisms and then we'll be covering some basic aspects of uh, composting and vermicomposting so uh, let us start from the fungi now fungi is uh, another important uh, soil microflora it is a uh, smallest acclorophyllous plant i would say and fungi is the filamentous organisms with much larger cell width than that of actinomycetes and the filaments are called hyphae and the network of hyphae is collectively termed as mycelium and the hyphae may be divided into cross world called septa uh, we, while those without septa are called senocytic or and predominantly multiplied by sporulum, uh, sporulation so uh, some uh, important genera which are frequently found in soils are pythium aspergillus penicillium you know, and then uh, you know verticillia, uh, alternaria, fusaria, but all these things. So they are mostly heterotrophs, and uh, they grow uh, basically uh, within the dead bodies and uh, you know dead organic matter. They thrive on dead organic matter, and some fungi are responsible for causing the plant disease also. So you can see here aspergillus, very really important, uh, very important fungi, soil fungi. Now, what is the role of soil fungi? Uh, so, fungi are primarily responsible for the decomposition of organic matter and, uh, and also the de deposition of organic matter. It is basically, it should be read as decomposition of organic matter and some fungi form a symbiotic association we have already covered that symbiotic association we call it mycorrhizal association and uh, guys i have already covered this vam thing in our uh, uh, phosphorus lecture so the association can be divided into you know that two types that is ectotrophic mycorrhiza examples are bolitus and amenita and uh, vam that is vesicular vascular mycorrhizae examples are glomus and endozini so these are some examples of ectotrophic and endotrophic mycorrhizae and basically you know that they increases the availability of the insoluble nutrients to the plants and also increases the mobility due to the faster intercellular nutrient mobility so that's why these uh, fungi are very very indispensable for maintaining the soil fertility now let's let now next uh, let us talk about algae Algae are uh, you know chlorophyll containing organism which are basically autotrophic and uh, the soil algae are classified based on their color. There are four major classification. One is called cyanophyta. This is the most important uh, or these are also known as blue green algae. And these are important from the point of view of uh, agriculture point of view because they synthesize the uh, you know they, they, are, they are important for biological nitrogen fixation. The other uh, groups are chlorophyta which are grass green algae, xanthophyta that is yellow green algae and bacillariophyta which are golden brown algae. Now blue green algae you know that they can fix nitrogen in rice field and it can supply oxygen to the aerobic organism in the flooded soil as it has photosynthesizing capacity also. So also they synthesize uh, plant growth promoting hormones. So the common genera in the soil are anabina, nostoc and tolipotrips. You know that anabina azuli is an important uh, algae which is responsible for synthesizing atmospheric nitrogen or uh, you know uh, fixing atmospheric nitrogen in the rice field. And <coughs> these are also uh, very very helpful and very very important from the agricultural point of view. Now the next important let, let us talk about uh, the soil microfauna, protozoa, let us talk about protozoa, they are basically single cell organisms, however the life cycle consists of two phases, one is the actively growing phases that is multiplication and secondly the resting phase that is uh, where they form cyst like structure in advanced uh, environment to protect themselves and they can be classified on the basis of their locomotion. So some moves by long whip like structures like for call, they are called flagella and others by short hair like structure called cilia and others by internal protoplasmic movement forming flexible temporary organs called pseudopodia. So these you know based on these they are you know they are classified. So you can see in the right side there is a flagellated protozoa you can see and they generally help in organic matter decomposition as well as because they are saprophytic in nature. 
and also they can feed on bacteria and maintain the biological equilibrium in the soil. The next important uh, microfauna are nematodes and among uh, these are and they are, they, are, they are next to protozoa in abundance and because of the narrow long bodies they are also called threadworms in this uh, and they are uh, you know they may be saprophytic or parasitic in nature. So, they do not have any significant role of organic matter decomposition, but they are responsible for many diseases in the plant as you can see here they are some uh, these are some. Uh, nematodes which are present in the plant and this is the one of the major plant disease called root knot disease which is created by these nematodes and they mainly infest the plant roots and form these characteristic knots in the roots and most of the time vegetable crops are mainly susceptible for this type of uh, nematode attack. And to reduce the infection different types of chemical fumigants and non edible neem and currant cakes and you know nematode trapping fungi are basically used. So, basically nematodes does not have any uh, I would say uh, beneficial effect on soil they are mostly uh, you know parasitic and they mostly uh, create some um, diseases in the plants. So, uh, we need to take care of these nematodes and uh, uh, and we need to eradicate the nematodes for the better growth of the plant in the soil. The last one is the viruses. Now, viruses are the smaller than that a bacteria and cannot be seen by ordinary microscope and they do not have any role in the nutrient transformation only uh, they are parasitic in nature and these virus which basically parasitizing bacteria known as bacteriophages you know that from your plus 2 knowledge and if the population of the bacteriophages increases it will hamper all the activity done by bacteria in soil like nutrient transformation, nitrogen fixation etcetera. So, this is a structure of bacteriophages you can see their capsid head which contains the nucleic acid or DNA and then followed by collar and sheath and then base plates and then spikes and tail fibers. So, this is a structure of a bacteriophages the viruses are also uh, very much abundant in the soil. So, guys we have completed this uh, soil organism lecture and uh, let us uh, go ahead and start another important topic or the last topic of this week that is compost. So, what is compost? Compost is basically an end product of composting. So, what is composting you can ask? So, composting is the basically decomposition of plant remains I would say control decomposition of plant remains and other ones living animal uh, materials to make an earthy dark crumbly substance that is called compost and that is excellent for adding in house plants for enriching garden soils. So, this compost is basically a you know uh, it is a <coughs> decomposed uh, organic matter which contains high amount of nutrient and people generally use this compost for their um, you know enriching different types of garden crops and uh, you know different types of vegetables and there are several types of composting methods. And composting is one of the major soil organic manure. Now, why we should use the compost? The question may come. Now, first of all since it is a high amount of organic it is, it is another it is a it is basically an organic matter which we, we are basically adding into the soil compost improves the soil structure texture and aeration and it increases the soil water holding capacity obviously since they are having high amount of organic matter they are increasing the soil structure and their aggregates and also their aeration by improving the st soil structure and uh, also they are improving the soil water holding capacity because you know that organic matter contains huge amount of micropores which can hold a huge amount of uh, water and also compost loosens clay soils and helps sandy soils to retain water. So, if we add some compost into the sandy soil the water holding capacity of the sandy soil will increase whereas if we add organic matter into the uh, compost into the clay soil which is hard in nature it will lose it down and it will help in better water movement and air movement. 
So this is the benefits of using compost into the soil and also it improves the soil fertility and stimulates healthy root development and organic matter which is present inside the compost provides foods for microorganisms like nitrogen, potassium and phos phosphorus mineralized. So these are a, you know several advantages of using compost which we should take care uh, we, you know take into consider consideration and uh, that is why uh, nowadays in all the countries this application of compost is highly recommended and it is also environmental friendly and for uh, I would say for any integrated nutrient management practices nowadays the application of compost is recommended along with the chemical fertilizer for maintaining the environmental sustainability. So, let us talk about composting in India. Now, generally composting can be carried out in seven techniques in India and they are basically listed here. One is Bangalore method and then another is Indore method, then NADEP compost, then NADEP phosphocompost, then Coimbatore method, then window composting and vermicompost. Now, in this lecture we will be covering only indoor method, NADEP compost and uh, vermicompost uh, because these are important in India and also Bangalore method and uh, you know Coimbatore methods are important. However, we will we'll, we'll, we'll not have time to discuss those in details, but if you are interested you can go ahead and search some literature which will discuss in th those in details. So, let us start with the indoor method. Okay. So, but before that before discussing indoor method in details let us see who developed these methods. So, this indoor method was developed by A. Howard and Y. D. Ward at the institute of plant industry that is uh, in indoor India. So, that is why this method is known as the indoor method and Bangalore method was worked out by Ellen Acharya at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore and NADEP method was uh, you know first demonstrated by this uh, you know at this Jain Keshi Vishwavidyalaya at uh, Indore. So, uh, these are three important methods of composting in India. Now, let us start with the Indore method. Now, in case of indoor method the pits will look like this. So, you have to create the pits and size of the pits will be the breadth will be 6 to 8 feet, depth will be 2 to 3 feet, it should not be more than 2 to 3 feet and length should be 10 feet or more as per the requirement. So, what are the raw materials we generally use in case of indoor method? Mixed plant residues we generally use, we also use cow dung, we also use weed, sugar cane, we also use urine soaked mud and grass and wood ashes, bran etc. So, these are the materials which we use as the raw materials in indoor method of composting. So, let us see how we can create this indoor method of compost, indoor compost. So, first of all we have to spread dry leaves with cattle dung and in soil in the ratio of 4 is to 2 is to 1 up to 2 inch layer in the composting pit. So, this is the first layer and pit is filled with above material up to 1 foot above the ground level. Okay. Now, after that once it reaches the 1 foot above the ground level then we have to sprinkle the water over the materials. And one more layer of bedding materials with wood ash and urinated mud should be added. So, this is how it is created layer by layer and we can go up to 1 feet of the ground. So, after we place the compost for decomposition, we need to give some turning. Now, turning is required for proper aeration and moisture. So, you can see the material uh, for proper aeration and moisture and we required at least 3 turning. So, first turning is basically given at 10 to 15 days after filling the pits and second turning is given 15 days after first turning 
and the third turning is given basically after two months of second turning. So these turnings are necessary for proper aeration and moisture and proper formation of compost. So this is about the indoor method of composting. Now let us talk about NADEP method. Now this method facilitates a lot of composting through minimum use of cattle dung. And in this method, the decomposition process takes place aerobically. And the tank should be located near the cattle shed or farm site. And important is the tank should be 10 feet by 6 feet by 3 feet in size and are prepared within 9 feet in, uh, in a 9 inch thick wall. So, it should be 9 inch thick wall. So, proper blocks and holes of 7 inch should be left on all the four sides of the tank wall for the circulation of air. So, you can see this is an example of Nadef compost bed and you can see all the holes are created for proper aeration and circulation of air. And plastering of inner wall and floors so of the tank should be done by mixing of dung and mud. So, this is very very important. So, this is how we create a NADEP compost pit and again remember this method was first demonstrated in JNKV in Indore. So, in case of NADEP method, these are the materials which are required. First of all, we require farm residues because it you know in the previous slide you have seen that we should make this pit near the farms. So, farm residues will be used as an important raw material for this Nadip compost. So, we required 1400 to 1500 kg of farm residue. We required cattle dung of 90 to 100 kg. We required dry sieve soil of 1750 kg and then water in 1500 to 2000 liter. So, these are the raw materials which we require for this uh, NADEP compost. So, what are the process, filling processes? So, there are two at least two filling processes. So, let us talk about the first filling process in case of NADEP compost. So, first of all, slurry made of cow dung and water should be sprinkled on the floor and the walls of the tank and the filling of the tanks follows this following steps. So, first layer obviously plant residues are spread evenly in layer of 6 inches that is 10 to 100 kg in the tank and second layer 4 to 5 kg cattle dung of biogas slurry in 125 to 150 liters of water should apply on the first layer and in the third layer 50 to 60 kg of sieve soil added on the second layer of the tank. So, again in the first layer will be produced will be uh, will be will be applying plant residues and will be spreading the plant residues evenly in layer up to 6 inches and then in the second layer we will add 4 to 5 kg of cattle dung of biogas slurry in 125 to 150 liters for water and apply it in the, over the first layer and in the third uh, over the in the third layer we will add 50 to 60 kg of sieve soil in the over the second layer of the tank. So, in this way the tank is filled layer by layer up to 1.5 feet over the above the brick level of the tank. Now, this filled tank should be covered and sealed by 3 inch layer of soil that is 300 to 400 kg and it should be pasted with a mixture of dung and soil. So, if you go back and see the previous slide where I have shown you. So, this is the plastering you can see at the top with cow dung and soil mixture which is required for this another method. So, you spread all these required raw materials in layers by layers and after that once it reaches the required depth after the over the bricks of the tank then you plaster it through the mixture of uh, soil and this cow dung. So, this 
is basically the process of first feeling. Now what is the process of second feeling? At this stage, the process of the first feeling is repeated again and sealed with a paste of mud and dung. So after 20 days, the plant residues contracts and goes down in the tank by 20 to 25 inches, obviously because when the decomposition will go on, obviously there will be reduction in the volume and reduction in the weight. And periodically, the paste of cattle dung and water should be sprinkled to maintain the 15 to 20 percent of the moisture. So, this is the method of second filling in case of Nadeb method. So, guys, we have completed these two methods, important methods. Obviously, the other methods are Bangalore method and Coimbatore method. You can, you can consult some literature to search in details about those methods. But let us talk about very important process that is vermicomposting. Now, vermicompost also called warm compost or vermicast and warm casting are warm humus or warm manure. So, there are several names, names for this uh, you know compost is basically the end product of the breakdown of organic matter by some species of earthworms, basically the epigeic earthworms. So, vermicompost is a nutrient rich natural fertilizer and soil conditioner. It improves the soil physical, chemical and biological conditions. So, the process of producing vermicomposting is known as vermi, uh, I am sorry, the process of producing vermicompost is known as vermicomposting. The earthworm species are composting worms, most often are, uh, you know, brandling worms, also known as Hycinia foetida, it is the most important worm, or sometimes red wigglers like Lambricus, Rubellus, and also Periunix excavators, Eudrilus, Eugenie. So, these are some common, uh, you know, um, common species of earthworm which we use for uh, producing the vermicompost. So, now you can see this is a vermicompost. And how we produce the vermicompost, we will see in the next slide. So, vermiculture, which is derived from the Latin word vermis, means, meaning warm, it in involves the mass production of earthworm for waste degradation and composting with vermicus production. So, earthworms remember they are the intestines of the earth. Vermi comes from the you know vermi means worm and it involves this vermiculture means the mass production of earthworms for waste degradation. So, they occur in diverse these earthworms occur in diverse habitats especially those which are dark and moist areas. And organic material like humus, cattle dung and kitchen waste are highly attractive for some species. So, they ingest those materials, some amount they you know retain for their uh, own biomass creation and they convert the other you know remaining portion and they just excrete it out and that is a very very huge source of nutrient. So, this is called the vermicompost. Now, What actually these earthworms do? So, they basically maintain the aerobic condition in the mixture. So, basically they ingest soil and convert a portion of the organics into the warm biomass and do respiration into respiration products and expel the remaining partially stabilized matter at discrete material we call it castings and these are basically the worm cast or vermicompost. So, worms and aerobic mesophilic microorganisms act symbiotically to accelerate and enhance the decomposition of the organic matter. So, that is how this is another form of our compost and this compost we shall add to different for, 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 for encouraging the growth of the different plants. So, what are the properties, important properties or beneficial properties of the worm compost? Well, they are very finely structured, uniform, stable and aggregated particles of humified organic material and they have excellent porosity, aeration and water holding capacity and they are rich in available plant nutrients and hormones, enzymes and microbial populations and they are mostly pathogen free because plant and human pathogens are killed during the passage of the earthworm gut. And earth like soil building substances that forms a building a beneficial growing environment within the in the for plant roots and 
they are, these vermicomposts are valuable and marketable products. So again, these if we apply these vermicompost into the soil, they improve the soil part aggregation. They have excellent. They increase the porosity. They increase the aeration. Increase the water holding capacity. All these are beneficial in nature. Also, they are rich in plant nutrients, which helps in uh, you know uh, proper growth of the plant. They secrete some hormones. They secrete enzyme for degradation of organic matter or conversion or or or, or the nutrient transformations. They are pathogen free. Another good thing about this vermicompost, they are, you know, they are virtually odor free. So these are very, very good. I mean, they are not producing any odor. So plant and human pathogens are also killed because, you know, they are moving through the guts of the earthworms. And the, you can sell these products as a very, very valuable and marketable product because these are very, very attractive things for gardening and, uh, you know, vegetable crops. So, uh, this is the vermicompost pit. Basically, vermicompost can be, you know, vermicompost are developed in the shady area. So, basically, we develop the pits, you can see here, using different materials, you can see, uh, you can, you can create these uh, vermicompost, uh, you know, like, you know, vermicompost pits using some muds, using bricks, and within this uh, vermicompost pit, you can, uh, basically spread layers of different materials basically you can add farm residues or kitchen wastes and then you can add a slurry of uh, cow dung as well as water and after that you can further add another uh, layer of these uh, 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 farm residues and all these things and after that you uh, you know, after that, these earthworms are released here in these uh, vermi beds, and we have to create a, a uniform moisture condition, and they are basically covered through some uh, uh, you know moist bags to maintain the moisture condition. And after a certain period of time, these microorganisms will ingest these materials and ultimately they will convert these materials into vermicompost, which can be further sieved and, you know, further it, you know, once this material will be produced, they will be dark in color, they will be odor free and basically uh, they will be harvested and then sieved and packed in the as a final product. So, uh, this is the vermicomposting product guys. So, uh, you can search some several materials uh, or literature which are uh, which talks about this vermicomposting composting process. There are different processes of vermicomposting but obviously one thing is common all of them are using different uh, you know all of them are using the uh, you know uh, earthworms for production of vermicompost and uh, these vermicompost are very very beneficial for the growth of the plant and uh, so guys uh, there are other also different other types of compost like kitchen compost you can uh, you can disc you, you can search some literature about those things and there are some available biodigesters which are now available uh, which you can use in your home to produce your uh, to produce the the compost for your own kitchen garden because each and every day the kitchen waste which are generated we can recycle those kitchen waste into the one you know in, inside those biodigester to produce the organic compost so the you know composting is a very very interesting process and these composting process is very very environmental friendly guys and these are uh, also very very beneficial so it is a very important waste management practice a solid waste management practice so uh, let us wrap up the week 8 lectures here uh, i hope that you have learned something new in this uh, week and we have covered several important topics like soil testing like uh, you know organic matter like macro and microorganisms then composting then vermicomposting all these are important topics I hope that you have, you, have, you have got some basic overview of these important topics and uh, if you are interested, please feel free to email me to learn in details or you can go ahead and search some literature 
to gain further knowledge. Thank you very much and in the uh, next lecture we will be starting uh, the week 9 of lectures. Thank you very much guys.